almost speak without a microphone. I think this is a very august but small audience. It's my pleasure to. Uh, uh, I am Barbara Osher, by the way, um, uh, the cons honorary, con a very unpaid consul general of Sweden in San Francisco, and we are extremely proud to be here at the Magnus Museum. And thank you, uh, George Breslauer. Thank you, Eric, for what you have done, and Francesco, who has been showing us the fantastic. Mendelssohn exhibition in the next room, which I recommend that you see. But it's my privilege today to introduce Ingrid Karlberg, who has traveled here from actually your latest outpost was Ottawa, where she came, she came from there yesterday, and uh, sadly enough, she lost her wallet to somebody very early in the morning. We don't know who, but we, and you probably won't get it back. But anyway, Despite that, Ingrid made it to San Francisco, and we are very happy that you're here. <laughs> she is going to talk today about her English translation, or her actually her biography about Raoul Wallenberg. So I will not say much about this uh, Swedish hero who, di who um, disappeared behind the Soviet lines. That is up to Ingrid, but I'll tell you a bit about Ingrid. Uh, she comes from a small place which I know, Surahammar, which is um, in the Ironworks region of Sweden, about two hours uh, northwest, I should say, from Stockholm. And she had a very clear eye for where she was going. She went to Uppsala University and then uh, started writing. And she, is, she was an investigative journalist at Dagens Nyheter for quite a long time, uh, and started sort of dabbling in uh, book writing by writing a book, My Brother Benjamin, uh, in, what was that, 2002. And that, in a sense, I think, Ingrid, launched your uh, career as a very distinguished author. She uh, wrote a remarkable book called The Pill, which was um, nominated, which got a lot of awards, and it's actually about the juxtapositions between uh, psychiatric treatment via pills or conversations or yeah, analysis. And it caused quite a stir within the Swedish community when it appeared, and it was nominated for an August Prize, but um, she got a lot of other prizes for it instead. Then she set out to write this remarkable biography about Raoul Wallenberg. It took many years and a lot, about four years, you said, Ingrid, to write it, and a lot of um, research behind the book. It's a remarkable book which I would highly recommend that you read. Uh, it's about a person who grew from being um, not a very well-known Swede into becoming a world hero after his death. We did not get the books that we should, so if you would like to have one of her books, please turn to Katarina, whom I should thank for organizing this. Katarina Sagerström is with the Consulate General of Sweden in San Francisco, and she has ordered books, and she will be able to send them to you. They didn't get here on time. With that said, why should I stand here when we have Ingrid Kalmer visiting? So please, Ingrid. Thank you. To start with, 
in the early spring of 1944, which is the country when, when the, the most the core of his deeds takes place. Raoul Wallenberg was a very was 31 years old and honestly a wrong born young man. His career had not turned out in the way he had wished for. He was still unmarried and he lived in a small apartment with a kitchenette in downtown Stockholm and I had been in that apartment. For the past three years, Wallenberg had worked in the food industry as the foreign director of a small Swedish-Hungarian import-export firm. And 1944, this year, very important year, had begun with one difficulty after the other for this business. That was called Mellan Europeiska Handels Aktiebolaget, for those of you who speak Swedish. Several hundred kilos of rotten Hungarian poultry had recently had to be thrown away. And the previously so lucrative horse export seemed to have stagnated entirely. Didn't I say, look, you should know that he is really, really an unexpected hero, as you can understand. He is in this office this spring, and not even an unexpected delivery of Spanish oranges could lighten the atmosphere in the office at Strandbergen 7A in Stockholm. The frustrated Raoul Wallenberg had been looking around for something different for a while now. He was waiting impatiently for his father's cousin, the bank director Jakob and Marcus Wallenberg, to make him a job offer. If not a position in the family bank, Stockholm's Enskilda Bank, then maybe something in one of the many industries that the wealthy banking family owned and operated. Raoul's own father had died a few months before he was born. And with each generation, Raoul's branch of the Wallenberg family tree had gotten further and further away from the well-known and prosperous Wallenberg business empire, one of the largest in Sweden. The son of a cousin wasn't exactly the most important thing on the minds of the wealthy bank directors. Time and again, his successful distant relatives had given him false hope of a new position. But in the beginning of 1944, Raoul had waited almost seven years for something more substantial, a position where he would be able to use more of the broad competence that he had acquired over the years. For Raoul Wallenberg, the grand assignment would indeed soon arrive, but not from Jakob and Marcus Wallenberg and not at all in the manner that he had imagined. 1944 meant the fifth year of war and the prevailing feeling in Europe at this time was that the German defeat was just around the corner. At this point, hardly anyone who followed the news could be unaware of the huge crime against humanity taking place in the middle of Europe. As early as in December 1942, the Allied countries presented a joint declaration against Nazi Germany's ongoing extermination of the European Jews. This protest was delivered in a speech by the British Foreign Minister, Anthony Eden. Eden showed that he already knew enough details to describe the Nazi slaughterhouses. He could tell the world how ghettos were empty and how several hundreds of thousands of innocent men and women were sent to their death. And I repeat, this joint declaration was presented already in December 1942. Unfortunately, it was nothing but words. The following day, the extermination went on and on. As historian David Weinman writes in his book, The Abandonment of the Jews, American President Roosevelt waited 14 long months before he finally agreed to a limited rescue effort for the threatened European Jews. For the Allies, the most important thing was winning the war. Thus, no resources could be set aside for humanitarian rescue missions. During the entire war, only 21,000 European refugees were allowed to enter the United States. And in the years before World War II, 
Round Valder, Sweden, had also been run of all that hard line, closing the borders to Jewish refugees rather than saving them. Raoul Wallemann himself had been spending the first half of the 1930s abroad. He was only 19 years old when his grandfather sent him to the United States to get a degree from an American university and to hopefully acquire a little of the American mentality. Or, in his grandfather Gustav's words, learn, quote, how to be a well-organized fighter aware that one must keep going on under all circumstances." End of quote. The most important thing here was simply to be in America. What Raoul studied didn't really matter. Raoul Wallerberg had a great artistic talent and had been interested in architecture since he was a little boy. Someone suggested a good architecture school connected with the Columbia University in New York. But Raoul ended up at this College of Architecture, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Why? The explanation is quite simple and touching. Because Gustav was so afraid that the wild social life among youth would destroy his master plan for Raoul. And he had suddenly realized that both the East and the West Coast of the United States were a bad at Stockholm in that respect. So we searched the map with a fine-tooth camp for a very safe and conservative American university in the Midwest, where this would not be the case. And at first, Raoul found Ann Arbor boring, too European, but he ended up loving it and started to feel like an American. It helped that he had a natural talent for languages. Just imagine a 19-year-old Swede coming to the United States and the very first semester here, snagging the position as the best student in English composition in his class. His friends called him Rudy and quickly forgot that he was a Swede. He did well in his studies, at least when it came to architecture and art. The art professor at the College of Architecture considered him the most gifted student he had encountered during his entire time teaching, and he asked Raoul if he would consider a career as an artist. In the end, Raoul Wallenberg really loved the United States and the people living here. As he wrote to his grandfather, quote, the nice thing about America is that people are not jealous and that they are not petty. Just think how much energy we waste at home, doubting everyone and everything. And think of all the discomfort we create for ourselves and for others by being pessimists by nature instead of optimists. And a decade later, he would bring that American optimist with him to Budapest. Don Alamay also visited San Francisco for one or two weeks. As you see, unfortunately, he here discovered that his love, love for the American people was not mutual. He was met with rather negative prejudices. Quote, it is very, from this very letter, it is very sad, but there's no mistaking. Over here, Swedes are known for only two things, honesty and stupidity. Quote, end of quote. And that's not true. <laughs> Uh, the idea with this U.S. adventure was not for Raoul to become an architect by profession. The goal for him had always been a life in business. So after he graduated from Ann Arbor, his grandfather arranged for him to spend another year abroad. He wanted Raoul to learn business basics as a low-level trainee, first in South Africa and then in British Palestine. When Raoul Wallenberg finally, in 1936, returned to his home country, he was met with growing Swedish xenophobia and anti-Semitism. For example, in the year before the war started, Sweden and Switzerland begged Germany to stamp a J in the passport of German Jews so the border police could stop Jews from entering these countries. In Sweden, there had also previously been repeated protests from various Swedish professional organizations 
against allowing German Jewish businessmen and doctors into Sweden. For competitive reasons, it was said. But that was, of course, not the whole truth. And back in his pre this pre-war Sweden, Ralf Wallenberg soon also met with a second private tragedy in his life. His grandfather, who had promised to introduce him into the highest circles of Swedish business life. He died just a few months after Ralf Wallenberg's return. So Raoul now had to struggle on his own, starting one fake company after the other, until he finally, in 1941, ended up with the first permanent position in his life, working in this food import-export business, Mellanelopiska Handelsexbolaget, in its small office on the fashionable address, Strandberg 7A in Stockholm. You know him a little, but who was he actually? The Raoul Wallenberg that later on, in the summer of 1944, in haste le left his safe home in neutral Sweden with a brand new diplomatic passport to lead a rescue mission for the Budapest Jews. It has been seven years since I started the research for my book about his life and destiny. And I can honestly tell you that the person Raoul Wallenberg still keeps fascinating me. Partly because of all the knots, all those things that people claim he was, but he most certainly was not. Raoul Wallenberg was not a career diplomat. When he left for Budapest, he actually had no diplomatic experience at all. He was an architect who for various reasons had chosen to go into business. He was not the heir of a vast fortune, nor the next generation to come in the Wallenberg business <coughs> empire. Those who knew him did not see an aspiring hero, nor an especially courageous man, rather the opposite. And Raoul Wallenberg always called himself a coward. Raoul Wallenberg was not a well-known person in Sweden before he left, he was hardly mentioned at all in Swedish newspapers, not before the drama surrounding his disappearance in 1945. He was in private, vehemently anti-Nazi, but he never publicly raised his voice in this issue in the debate during the war. That was simply not his way. The fatherless Raoul Wallenberg had always obeyed his late grandfather, whose mantra was, never jeopardize business opportunities by expressing your personal political views. Last but not least, after five years abroad, Raoul Wallenberg was not especially Swedish in his manners. He said to have had an international flair and rather saw himself as a citizen of the world. As I mentioned, in 1936, Young Raoul Wallenberg lived for several months in Haifa, Palestine, in a colony of German Jews who had fled Nazi persecutions. That gave him an insight into the severe conditions for the Jews in Nazi Germany, an insight that was rare in Sweden at the time. And since then, he was not, as most Swedes in that period, naturally inclined to view the persecuted European Jews with, with an us-versus-them perspective, he automatically saw the us, only the us, not from sentimentality, more as a natural reflex. He had done some research and learned that he had a microscopical part Jewish ancestry himself, which he often, and with pride, exaggerated in conversation with his friends. When Hungary started and began in the middle of May 1944, War Refugee Board sent a telegram to the American legations in five neutral European countries. Local American legations were asked to try to convince the neutral governments to extend their diplomatic representation in Budapest to pursue a mission financed by the Americans. And in Stockholm, the American legation was by coincidence located at Strandbergen 7A, the same building as the Swedish Hungarian import firm where Raoul Wallenberg worked. During this spring of 1944, 
1944, there had been already been a lot of discussions about rescue missions to Hungary in Jewish circles in Stockholm and exile Hungarian circles in Stockholm. The discussion had been intense also in Raul Wallenberg's office since his boss, Hungarian Karl Bauer, was of Jewish origin and of close relatives in Hungary whose lives were in danger. And the idea to send Raul to Budapest on a rescue mission had already been discussed in Stockholm. Raul, who had been to Budapest several times in business, had declared himself ready to go. So, of course, at this address, Stamberg 7A, it didn't take long for all those separate ideas of a Hungarian mission to become one. But wasn't Raul Wallenberg a Swedish diplomat? What about the role of the Swedish foreign ministry? Didn't Sweden have a plan of its own here? I can tell you that I have read all the correspondence between the foreign ministry in Stockholm and the Swedish legation or embassy in Budapest concerning rescue work in Hungary during the spring of 1944. There were a lot of different diplomatic rescue efforts, but there was actually no plan for such a huge Swedish government initiative not until the Americans introduced their idea. In the beginning of June 1944, the envoy, the American envoy in Stockholm, Herschel Johnson, suggested to the Swedish Foreign Ministry, as requested, that Sweden is extend its representation in Budapest for an American mission. And a few days later, he presented a suggestion for a candidate. The name was Raul Wallenberg. And Sweden, desperate in this situation to, at this time, desperate to please the Western allies, said yes, both to the idea and to the proposed cabinet. Sweden was, in fact, the only of those five neutral European countries that agreed to collaborate in this American mission. Within a week, everything was settled. Raoul Wallenberg was to go to Budapest on a Swedish-American mission led and financed, not so much led to be honest, but financed by the Americans. Sweden agreed to appoint him secretary at the Swedish legation and to pay his salary. Officially, the whole operation would be presented as a Swedish humanitarian diplomatic effort. So, he arrived at the Swedish legation in Budapest the 9th of July. That happened to be two days after a very crucial decision had been made regarding the destiny of the Hungarian Jews. Hungarian regent Miklos Horthy was still formally in place, but after the German occupation in March, Hungary had in reality been led by a Hungarian puppet regime. Up until now, Miklos Horthy had tried to distance himself from all the decision making. But in the beginning of July, he had finally decided to intervene. He managed to force the German's Hungarian puppet government to stop the deportations. More than 400,000 Jews had been deported during the last seven weeks. As of now, only the Jews of Budapest remained, around 200,000. So you might say that Raoul Wallenberg happened to arrive to Budapest in a period of relative calm. The deportations were halted, but still no one there in this situation to feel safe. Within days, rumors also started circulating about dates for when the deportations were to be resumed. So what did he do in Budapest? The most exaggerated tales about Ravala by leave you with a Hollywood-like impression. A Bruce Willis kind of hero that came from nowhere all alone and rescued tens of thousands of Jews. That is, of course, not even close to the true story, which is that Ravala by was just one of many actors in this dramatic situation in Budapest that autumn. So by, fo by focusing on what Raoul Wallenberg did in Budapest, I don't mean to downplay the action of, uh, action of other neutral diplomats, like the Swiss Herr Anger, the Swiss diplomat Karl Lutz, not to forget, and Angelo Rotta, envoy of the Vatican State. Nor do I want to downplay the importance of the Red Cross.
across the Jewish Council or the Hungarian resistance movement. A lot was also done in collaboration with all the neutral states working together. But that the Swede, uh, the S Sweden's first secretary in Budapest at the time, Per Angel, later stated, behind these joint actions by the neutral countries, you almost, almost always found the, the mind and the pen of Raoul Wallenberg. So I started by listing you all the knots that uh, is linked to Raoul Wallenberg's personality. But more important for the end result is, of course, the question of who he really was. I would describe him as a very young, well, very young, 32 years old in 1944. That is indeed very young. And very energetic man with an unusual creative and artistic talent. A man who in the army and in his business had demonstrated great talent for leadership, organization, and smart negotiation. A talkative person, if sometimes really tiring talkative, I have understood, with a remarkable inner driving force. He preferred, as we learn, American optimist to what he viewed as the innate Swedish pessimist. His attitude was more like nothing is impossible. And he was not a diplomat, which was a real asset in Budapest. Raoul Wallenberg was definitely more prepared to choose rule breaking strategies when necessary than most of the diplomats. And the strategy Raoul Wallenberg chose was action, <coughs> not only beautiful words. And I would like to highlight two of his actions in Budapest this autumn the Swedish Schutzpass and the bureaucracy of the rescue mission the and the organization of the international ghetto. It has often, it is often said that Raoul Wallenberg was the one inventing the creative protective paper that saved so many lives of Hungarian Jews this autumn, like Schutzpass, Schutzbrief and other similar papers that seemed official but weren't. That is actually not true. The original idea came from the Swiss diplomat Karl Lutz. He created his so-called emigration certificates to protect the Hungarian Jews who had applied for emigration to Palestine earlier. Raoul Wallenberg was not even first at the Swedish legation with this idea. But what happened was at the end of July 1944, both the Germans and the Hungarians got fed up with all this strange protective paper that flooded Budapest, designating people as Swedish or Swiss without a single sign that they had even visited either country. So then the rules were changed. Jews who were supposed to be under the protection of a neutral country must now show real passports with photos and stamps and official signatures. But Sweden couldn't stand, start handing out citizenships right and left without risking the status of all Swedish citizenships. Therefore, the new documents, of course, had to be fake as well. And that was one of Raoul Wallenberg's first tasks, to create such a document his artistic talent and creativity triumphed with this new Swedish Schutzpass. This was not an official passport either, but a pretend one, and with its credible appearance it plumped all other fake official protective papers in Budapest. Quite soon, Raoul Wallenberg realized that the main purpose of these Schutzpasses could not be to transfer thousands of Hungarian Jews to Sweden. That was far too dangerous and far too expensive. So he decided that instead the best thing to do was to concentrate on protecting them on site in Budapest. Very few of the Jews from Wallenberg saved in Hungary ever reached Sweden. And I have to show you this particular Schutzpass that once again, because it has been hanging on a frame in the inner frame of the wall in Raoul Wallenberg's sister's house in Stockholm. Uh, it shows the, the, the owner of the passport's name is Judith Kopstin. She is 14 years old according to this document. So during the research for my book, when I saw this passport on the wall every time I visited Raoul Wallenberg's sister, I decided to try to find, to, to find out what happened to her. But I didn't manage. It wasn't until after my book was published in Sweden 
that I find it to be an unimaginable chain of coincidences, found her in Canada, in Winnipeg. Judith, who married Weissmann, even visited Sweden, no, I don't have that picture here, but she even visited Sweden in 2014 and met, I could take her to Nina Fall, the sister of Raoul Wallenberg, in 2014, before she sadly passed away a few months later. That was a golden moment. Okay, the short pass, but we also have, I have to underline, Wallenberg's tremendous organizational skills. As soon as he arrived in Budapest this, this summer, he began developing his own organization at the legation, the Humanitarian Department, it was called. His staff grew so quickly that he soon had to move out of the Swedish legation to separate offices. Wallenberg, that is also important, recruited nearly all his staff among the Hungarian Jews who received Swedish protective papers. And in the end of 1944, the staff amounted to 350 persons working in a well-functioning, business-like organization. That was indeed really needed. In October, the Hungarian Nazi party, the Arrow Cross, took power after a coup planned by the Germans. After that, all hell broke loose in Budapest. You could briefly say that for a period there had been continuing threats towards the persecuted Hungarian Jews, but not much action. That changed on the 15th of October. After that, the threats were no longer idle, but were followed up by terrible acts of violence. The new Arab Cross government also decided to move all Budapest Jews into two ghettos. The majority of the persecuted Jews were displaced the central ghetto in the eastern part of Budapest, as you might know, it's called Pest. A tough uh, negotiation in which, which Balabai was involved led to all 35,000 Jews that were protected by neutral countries being moved to a special international ghetto further north in Pest. Raoul Balabai's organization established a new headquarters and five offices in Pest. Soon they had, had more than 30 buildings to manage and in the international ghetto and at least 10,000 people to provide with food and other necessities daily. They handled everything. Heating, broken windows, cooking for 1,500 people at the time, deliveries from several food supplies. Raoul and his humanitarian department even started a Swedish hospital in the international ghetto with some 40 doctors. All the expenses were paid for by War Refugee Board, who got 90% of their financing from American Jewish organizations. Raoul Balabé even had a special security service called the Schutzling Protocol, with around 20 persons on call 24 hours a day ready to spring into action whenever someone called in reporting an assault. Sometimes, Wallenberg also showed up personally when the alarm came, but more often he sent his patrols. And these Schiffsling Protocol patrols were of course important in November 1944, when the German master of deportations, the deportations Adolf Eichmann, had returned to Budapest and started his cruel death marches towards the Austrian border. Altogether, more than 35,000 people were deported on foot the 200 kilometers to Hegel Shalom at the Austrian border, many of them dying from hunger, cold, and fatigue during the war. Now, the Max Schutzling Protocol managed to save at least 2,000 people from these marches and from attacks in the streets. It is impossible to give an exact figure for the number of Hungarian Jews that had Raoul Wallenberg to thank for their lives directly and or indirectly this autumn. And as I said before, Raoul Wallenberg was also just one of many actors in Budapest 1944. So his personal contribution is hard to precisely number. Some were saved in act direct action, some were his some with his shoots passes and his food deliveries, some as a result of his negotiations. But even if we can't define the number, it is still it is very clear that his personality 
and this supreme sense of organization was the decisive engine behind much of what happened and what led to tens of thousands of Jews in Budapest being saved from the Holocaust. According to some sources, towards the end, the bad mentioning of the name Raoul Wallenberg was sometimes enough to save people. So what can we learn from this today? Confronted as we are with the perhaps, if not perhaps, with the largest refugee crisis since World War II with at least four million South Syrians fleeing their country. I think parallels are very tempting to draw, but difficult to draw, because the situation today is so different, the challenges mostly of another kind. Still, I would say that there might be one general lesson to be drawn. When tens of thousands of people are fleeing from absolute evil, political declarations and emotional speeches are needed, but never enough, no matter how beautifully worded they are. What is needed is action. You must organize and deliver. The ironic tragedy of this story is that this is exactly what was lacking when Raoul Wallenberg, in January 1945, became a victim himself of another awful human rights violation. When the Soviet army reached Budapest, Wallenberg voluntarily crossed the front to meet the Red Army and discuss a collaboration. But the Soviets answered by arresting him and he ended up imprisoned in Moscow. So in the third part of this book, I depict this long post-war drama that follows. It presented a real Cold War thriller a heartbreaking story, I must say, because it put me to tears while I wrote it. And what unfolds here is a tragedy filled with obvious lies and humanitarian abuse by the Soviet-Russian side, as well as naive political demeanor and astonishing diplomatic failures on the Swedish side. And stuck in the middle, Raoul Wallenberg's poor, suffering family. So I would like to conclude this uh, by giving you an overview of the post-war drama and the tragic family story in Sweden referred to as the Raoul Wallenberg case. With it, it is appropriate to divide this Raoul Wallenberg case into two principal periods. One, the phase when the Soviet Union told the truth about Raoul Wallenberg. Two, the phase when the Soviet Union excelled in lying about the missing Swedish diplomat. The truth period, the first one, was about a month long, from January to February 1945. The lying phase now amounts to more than 70 years. Period one first. Believe it or not, but in the beginning there was actually normal diplomatic correspondence between Sweden and the Soviet Union concerning Raoul Wallenberg's whereabouts. When the Red Army approached Budapest, the Swedish envoy in Moscow, Staffan Söderblom, was instructed by the government in Sweden to ask the Soviet Foreign Ministry for protection for the Swedish Budapest diplomats. The second Ukrainian army in Budapest received that order. And when Raoul Wallenberg initiated contact with them on the 13th of January 1945, they simply reported it back home. A certain Wallenberg had voluntarily crossed the front and was now under Soviet protection. The message was, message was forwarded to the Swedish envoy and then the, uh, further to the foreign ministry in Stockholm. In Stockholm, the reaction was, quote, my quote, oh, wonderful. At least one of the Swedish diplomats in Budapest is safe. Wallenberg's first contact with the Soviet commanders was also quite friendly. He even had dinner with the officer who first handed his request. They toasted each other and gave speeches. He spent several days walking around different army units, his goal being to reach the highest command, which was General Rodion Malinowski, further east in her Hungary at that time, in Debrecen. 
Jean Wallenberg even returned to Budapest to get his things before he disappeared. But after this, after he had got his, his things on the 17th of January, uh, things changed. There was a change in the climate suddenly, and an order for his arrest was issued in Moscow, signed by the Deputy Defense Minister Bugani, but or originally, as it turned out later, by, issued by Stalin himself. Rao Malabai was transported by train with his driver Vilmos Langfelter all the way to Moscow without Sweden raising any further questions about his whereabouts. And the 6th of February 1945, Raoul Valabai was registered as a prisoner at the Lubyanka prison in central Moscow. This Swedish lack of reaction in this very important phase was of course stupid, but so far still maybe understandable, because in Stockholm at this point everyone was more anxious about the Budapest diplomats, the other the Budapest diplomats that had not been heard from. Still, a single formal diplomatic note about Wallenberg during this period of truth might have changed the outcome. By the end of February 45, it was already too late for that kind of normal diplomatic communication. The everlasting Soviet disinformation campaign and lies had then already begun. But why was he arrested? I would like to claim that it would have been strange indeed if they had not arrested him, not because Raoul Wallenberg was a criminal, but because we all know that Joseph Stalin was. And you don't have to read very much about conspiracy theories in Stalin's Soviet Union during this last year of war to, in order to understand that Raoul Wallenberg unfortunately was naive to think that the Russians would applaud his actions instead of challenging them. Swedish diplomats in Budapest seem to have been unaware of this, but the diplomatic climate between the Soviet Union and the United States had by that time reached a severe chill, foreboding the Cold, Cold War. That the organization Ravalabai worked for was American was hardly appreciated in the Kremlin, to say the least, despite the two countries being on the same side in the war. And Soviet suspicions were likely to have increased with the question marks that appeared in the wake of Raoul Wallenberg's own creative courage. Because Raoul Wallenberg had no problem dealing with the devil if that was the price he had to pay to save yet another human life or more. In his calendar and address book, there were many names of high up arrow crossers and Nazis like Adolf Eichmann. But the positive purpose of these Nazi contacts was hardly the first thing that came to mind for the officer in the Soviet counter espionage. We know today that Raoul Wallenberg was alive in Soviet prisons for at least two and a half years. So the great puzzle in this tragedy is not why he was seized, but why the Russians did not let him go. For this, unfortunately, the Swedish government has a great deal of responsibility, and I don't hesitate to call what later happened the Swedish betrayal of Raoul Wallenberg. This change in the Soviet messages from truth to lies first took shape of rumors spread at diplomatic cocktail parties in several countries and via Soviet controlled radio stations in Hungary. The new information that was spread in February, March 45 was simply the opposite of what what had been said before. Now it was claimed that Raoul Wallenberg had disappeared in Budapest and that he had most likely died in an accident or something. The first serious Swedish betrayal then came right away because the first people to swallow this malicious Soviet disinformation were the Swedish diplomats, both those on their way back from Budapest and those in Moscow, with one important exception. Per Anger, Wallenberg's closest colleague in Budapest. But unfortunately, nobody listened to Per Anger at this time. Therefore, you might say that already in 1945, 
this rumor was transformed into some kind of un unofficial truth in the corridors of the foreign ministry in Stockholm. Raoul Wallenberg was most certainly dead. And this uh, in official truth, unofficial truth, lay of course a tragic foundation for all the missed opportunities that later emerged. It didn't exactly help that the Swedish post-war foreign policy toward the Soviet Union could be summarized as attempting to keep Stalin in a good mood, out of fear of drastic and more violent Soviet actions towards Sweden. Addressing the Soviet, the, addressing the Raoul Wallenberg case was not seen as a way to keep relations with the Soviet Union smooth and friendly, which unfortunately in the eyes of the social democratic government became one very strong reason for not doing it. The most important of these missed opportunities that followed is when the Soviet initiative toward a press prisoner exchange at the end of 1945. What makes this strategic move even more interesting is that Moscow at the same time pursued negotiations regarding an exchange of two imprisoned Swiss diplomats, Harald Feller and Max Meyer, whose order of arrest happened to be issued the same day as that of Raoul Wallenberg. The negotiations with the Swiss succeeded and some Soviet citizens imprisoned in Switzerland were exchanged for the two Swiss diplomats. The parallel Swedish case involving Raoul Wallenberg failed. Because so successful had the disinformation campaign been that the Swedish ambassador in Moscow, Staffan Söderblom, instead of discussing exchanges, privately asked his counterpart at the Soviet foreign ministry to issue a statement once and for all, indicating that Raoul Wallenberg was dead, if for no other reason than to release Raoul Wallenberg's mother from her, quote, false hope, end of quote. At that time, Raoul Wallenberg was of course alive in the Le Fortovo prison, but that scenario didn't seem to have occurred to the Swedish uh, minister, Staffan Söderblom. Half a year later, Wallenberg was still alive in that same freezing cold prison. Then, in June 1946, Söderblom managed to be one of the extremely few foreign diplomats who was granted an audience with Stalin himself. Unfortunately, Söderblom chose the same strategy during this historic meeting, reassuring Stalin that he personally was convinced that, quote, Wallenberg had fallen victim to an accident or an assailant, end of quote. Finally, in the summer of 1947, Sweden managed to get an official answer out of the Kremlin regarding the whereabouts of Raoul Wallenberg. Not surprisingly, it was a lie. Raoul had in fact been imprisoned for two and a half, half years and his name had already caused trouble at the Politburo level in the Soviet Union. But the official message to Sweden in 1947 read that Wallenberg was, quote, not to be found in the Soviet Union and is unknown to us, end of quote. Sweden was confronted this time with a humiliating Soviet lie. The Swedish government couldn't imagine lies on such a high political level and believed every word. Sweden resigned from pursuing the matter without once officially having demanded the release of Raoul Wallenberg. The betrayal went on and on. Year after year, Raoul Wallenberg's family fought alone for truth, repeatedly and brutally thrown between hope and despair. My research also involves this, that side of the drama. I have read all of Raoul's stepfather, Fredrik von Darlow's extensive and immensely moving diaries and their attachments, with incoming letters and copies of outgoing letters. One example is this letter, dated April 1956. I will give you a short background. Since 1947, the family had been living with the Soviet lie that Raoul had not been seen and was not known in the Soviet Union. 
But in 1955, suddenly, thousands of German prisoners of war were sent back home from the Soviet Union. The Swedish foreign ministry sent some officials to Germany to meet with those released uh, prisoners of war. And quite a few of those prisoners could report that they had been in contact with a Swedish prisoner called Raoul Wallenberg. In October 1955, foreign ministry staff even managed to interview Gustav Richter, Raoul Wallenberg's first cellmate in Lubyanka. Intense information gathering began in Sweden. And by coincidence, the Swedish Prime Minister was scheduled for a first official visit in Moscow on Easter 1956, just half a year after this. He brought all this new evidence with him, and suddenly the Swedish words had taken on some significance. The Prime Minister was even convinced that he would bring Raoul Wallenberg back to Sweden. So were Raoul Wallenberg's mother and stepfather. They wrote a letter to Raoul, which they asked the Prime Minister to bring with him. Our dear beloved Raoul, after many years of mis misery and endless longing for you, we have now come so far that the leaders of our government, Prime Minister Elander and Minister Hedlund, are traveling to Moscow to finally see to it that you are allowed to return home. May they succeed and may your suffering now be at an end. We have never given up hope that we would see you again, although to our great sorrow, all of our efforts to get in contact with you thus far have failed. This is not a sentimental letter. Rather, it is informative and instructive for the now 43-year-old son to read before his return. For instance, they warned Raoul of, of the journalists that accompanied the Prime Minister to Moscow. We ask that you do not allow them to interview you. You should say that you must first give a report to the Foreign Ministry and that you also need to rest and recuperate. There is a room here waiting for you when you return with the Prime Minister. And that sentence, there is a room here waiting for you, was actually the title for the Swedish edition of this book. But the Prime Minister didn't return with Raoul Wallenberg. The only result he got from his effort was that the life from the Soviet side changed. Faced with so much evidence, the Kremlin had to do something. Soviet officials were given the order to come up with something that could pass as a half truth a possible deceit or something. The first suggestion now was to tell the Swedes that Badala had died of pneumonia in the Lefortovo prison. One year later, the official response to Sweden was yet another. The Soviets admitted that Badalaberg had in fact been imprisoned in the Soviet Union. Now they claim that he unfortunately died, uh, died of a heart attack in his cell in the Lubyanka prison. 17th of July 1947. Even today, this is the official Russian version. We all know it is a lie. So to conclude, the ironic tragedy in this story is the obvious. There was simply never a Raoul Wallenberg for Wallenberg himself. So that was it. <laughs>